Have a good time. Pray that you're blessed as you go and do your thing. If you remember a few weeks ago, um, I said that we were going to book end Thanksgiving. Last weekend, can you get, wrap your mind around this? Last weekend was Thanksgiving weekend. That feels like eight months ago. I mean, Black Friday hits. We get into the Christmas rush. My daughter wants the Christmas tree up. My wife's talking about, well, we, we got Joel List. We got to get, we got Levi. We, we got to get out. I got, what do you think about this for Ethan? And so we've got all of the Christmas bustle going on right now. You got it going on in your life. I have it going on in my life. And Thanksgiving is but a distant memory. It feels gone. But we're bookending Thanksgiving. We're bookending gratitude this week. Two weeks ago, we started out. Last week, we did it. And this week, we're going we're gonna to bring it to a close, and then we're going to launch into a five-week sermon series on, on the gift of Christmas. What's that gift? What, what does the meaning of that gift do for us? Today, we're going to take a look at Luke chapter 17, 11 through 19. And I'm going to read our gospel text today in Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the borders between Samaria and Galilee. Take note of that. As he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. He called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They all called out, crying out to the Lord. When he saw them, he said, Go. Show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith. Say it with me. Your faith has made you well. Today as we wrap up this sermon series on gratitude, I want us to, I want us to ask ourselves a significant question before we dive into this text. And the question is, As you are going through life, some of you are grandpas and grandmas, some of you are parents, some of you are just getting started, you're you're really just getting married, you're going to be getting married. I mean, the, the, the question just was popped in the last six months, you're planning a wedding, you're thinking about your future, you're thinking about how many kids are we going to have, you know, and... Uh, where should we buy a house and what kind of a career are we going to have or I'm going to stick with this career and hope I can work my way up in this. I mean, you got all those plans going on. The kids, you high school and college boys that are here, you're thinking about what kind of a career should I do? The parents that have been married for a few years like uh, Mrs. Bowman and myself, we are thinking, oh God, let our kids make it, all five of them. And for some of you, six, for some of you, two or three, whatever it is, We are praying. But one thing we all know for sure is is that life has its troubles. Life has its struggles. Life has its ways of sending twists and turns to us. And here in our text, as we start peeling apart this text, I want you to hear about how God breaks in to some folks' lives that have zero hope. Zero hope. And the same God who touched these lepers' lives is the same God who's here that wants to set you free. And maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're struggling with your marriage. Maybe you're struggling with your work, your boss, your colleagues, your siblings. Maybe you're struggling with your husband, your wife, your kids, your adult kids. Maybe you're struggling because you've gotten some bad news. Whatever it is that you're struggling with right now, today, that you have a burden. I want you to hear God working through this text today for nine people who are hopeless and helpless. 
and see how the hand, the healing hand of God was active, moving for those who had ears to hear and for those who could respond to the work of God. Now, in our text, we see that this gospel lesson in Luke brings the account of 10 lepers. You've all read it before if you've read the Bible at all. And Jesus is dealing with these 10 lepers. One faithful man returns and gives thanks to God, and Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Jesus was going to Jerusalem. And this is interesting, something you probably missed as I was reading this text. Jesus was going to Jerusalem, and this journey to Jerusalem would be the last trip Jesus would make before he suffers and dies on the cross. Notice how Jesus had no hesitation, but more importantly, notice there could have been hundreds of ways Jesus could have went to Jerusalem, but Jesus chose this route. The route, according to our text today, was the route that bordered Samaria and Galilee. Jesus knew exactly what this route would do. This route that he chose would bring him into a village where there would be 10 hopeless, helpless people struggling with an uncurable disease, waiting to die a very early death, a very painful death. Jesus knew that he was going to be coming right through their village, running into all 10 of these men with leprosy. And what happens? They cried out to him. Because people with leprosy were considered incurable. Leprosy is a form of a skin disease where you get lumps and sores and open sores and bruises. It seeps, it drains, and it's more unbelievably painful than you can ever imagine. The deformities come at a high rate because you scratch and you itch at your skin and it literally eats your bones and flesh from the inside out. You start to lose fingers and toes. Even your nose and your ears start to disappear. They wrap themselves, their head up with bondage. They wrap their hands up with bandages because they don't want anyone to see their hideousness from the outside. People with leprosy were considered unclean and so they would stand many feet away from a person and as someone would be walking up to them not noticing that they're lepers they were commanded to cry out unclean unclean and if not heavy heavy uh, um, uh, consequences would come to the lepers who were not willing to say unclean some of the things that they missed most were the community and the jewish ceremonies of worship Lepers could not go near any Jewish worship ceremonies. You know, one of the things the Lord showed me is when you take something away from someone, they miss it more than ever. When someone's got something free willy-nilly, you can go, you can come, you can do as you please. Then all of a sudden, you start not really taking, or you start taking church for granted, and you start really not caring about what God has for you in a church service. But there's a reason why the Word of God declares that that we are not to forsake the weekly fellowship of gathering together because you, you notice at the beginning of the service, we allowed people to confess their sin. I just want to help you to understand it was the born-again believers confessing their sin. There are some people sitting in this worship service that think, well, I hope I'm good to go. I'm not sure I'm good to go. And there are some that know, I know I'm not good to go. And for those people, the service is, is bringing them to the cross to help them for the first time do what the rest of us did at the beginning of the service, which is to confess our sins, trust Christ, look to God, and be brought back into a living, personal, trusting relationship because we tend to veer to veer. So for the first-timers, they are brought to Christ and saved. And for those of us that come on a weekly basis, we love to be in the presence of God. Why is it so important? Because if we just sit and listen online, my friends, you miss something. Yes, the Holy Spirit can touch you when you listen online. But when you're in the presence of God with his people, the Spirit of God is moving. And you can't reproduce that in front of a TV screen. Amen? You need to start telling your friends Church isn't sitting at home in front of a computer screen. Church is getting up and getting to a church. 
And I don't care where you're at. I don't care what part of the world you live in. And I know I got people that watch me all over the world. I get messages and people watching the service. I'm glad you're watching, but get yourself into a church as well. You can listen to a good worship service online. You can go and you can be part of what God is doing. Find a Bible-believing church that believes in the inerrant and fallible word of God. Get into a church that's not afraid to pray over someone that's sick and believe that miracles can happen and God can heal now on the spot. Trust that God, his word, can bring people to a personal salvation and be willing and able to be part of what God is doing in a good, godly church. You see, God was healing lepers he was moving, and the 10 lepers uh, in our text that were standing at a distance purposely were isolating themselves, and in verse 13, they were calling out in a loud voice, Jesus, have mercy upon us. And in, in my first point, we see that Jesus has ears, and his ears are open to our cries for mercy. Their petition was a prayer of faith. That's how Luther saw it. He, he saw them as, as they cried out that, that, that it, was, it was almost like a petition of a prayer of faith. More than likely, these lepers had heard about Jesus. All they knew is that he was a man who preached hope and they wanted to be a part of what God was doing because people's lives were being changed. And these were a people who had no hope. And so, thanks be to God, rumor had it that Jesus is coming. Can you imagine? They're sitting, standing outside the city gates, and up over the hill comes Jesus and, and his disciples, and they're walking towards him, and they say, could it be? Could that be the one? That, that one that's coming towards us? Do you think it could be him, Jesus? Have you been so broken and desperate in your sin? Has life been so hard on you that you're that hungry for Jesus to come over the hill and come towards you? Because my friend, if God's brought you into his worship service today, Christ is coming for you. Amen? God wants to do, do, do business with you. He wants to deal with you. And so what, does he, what do they do? They cry out to him. And he lets us cry out to him in this worship service as he is active and present. The body of God, you, his body, assembles. And he is present when the word is read and he starts to move in miraculous and unbelievable ways. Obviously, they believe that Jesus had the power to heal them. And they made no demands on Jesus. They just came crying out to him him merely uh, in, in, as an appeal for mercy and compassion because they were so hopeless and helpless that they knew that they were unworthy and undeserving but hopefully God have mercy on us and they set the example for us as we come into church every single Sunday when we come in with a humble attitude and a humble spirit that we are going to be brought before the living God, that we are going to hear his word preached, and he is going to, uh, they are going to give us the example of how we see Jesus as the promised Messiah, as we see Jesus as the Son of God, the one who came to earth to fulfill the divine prophecy. You say, well, what divine prophecy are you talking about, Pastor Sean? Well, uh, today marks the beginning of a five-week church calendar year called Advent. Advent, kids, is Christmas. It's Jesus coming to earth and giving us the hope that we could have something beyond anything that we can measure up in ourselves. This is God who sent his son in the form of a baby produced in the womb of a woman who is trying to live her, faith, her life out in Christ. This woman, Mary, she brings Jesus into the world. And we know that he lived his life a perfect man in order to become the fulfillment of the law of God on our behalf through his death and resurrection on the cross. He made the complete atonement. In other words, he made all the work necessary so that he could be the propitiation or the sacrifice. He could be the acceptable thing given to God on our behalf. And in order for that to happen, God had to separate himself. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But he had to do it all alone so that you and I had a journey away to heaven. Amen. 
This is the work of God on our behalf. The death and resurrection makes a complete atonement for the sins of the whole world, not just for a few that are good in the world, not for just a few of the elect. No, no, no. He does it for the whole world. Do I believe in a universalism? No, I believe that he forgave the sins of the whole world so that when you hear the word of God, you can confess and receive and believe and become part of the narrow gate, the narrow gate which trusts and walks in the righteousness of grace because now you are born from above, born again, and God has brought you into that deliverance and we know that he was delivered from, from death. He delivers us from death, our own death, the second death. He delivers us from our sins and he rises to new, to new life. And when, we, and when we are brought to new life, this is called justification. Uh, he is seated back with the Trinity and he sends his Holy Spirit down to work on us. And him's coming back through his word to us is called justification. In Romans 4.25, we see a beautiful picture of how he was delivered to death for our sins, raised to new life for your and my justification. Now we know that we know that he even now sits at the right hand of God. And what is he doing? He's praying and interceding for us. In Romans chapter 4, verse, or chapter 8, verse 34, it says, and he who, and he, it says, he, ha, who is he that condemns? Question mark. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life? is at the right hand of God and is interceding for those that condemn. So who are those that condemn? There are three major entities. The devil is one. The world is the other one. And this is the tough one. The very thing that you love most and I love most, your flesh and my flesh. The war that we fight against is what we look at in the, picture, in the mirror every single day. And we fall in love with me, myself, and I. And the question starts out in Romans 8, 34, who is he that condemns? And when the devil comes knocking, the world comes knocking, and when our own flesh starts to bring conviction of the things that we've said and done, Jesus is busy interceding for you. 1 John 2, 1 says this, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but anyone who does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus, the righteous one. We know that he who overcomes will not only overcome, but we will be given to him and he will never drive us away. Take a look at uh, that passage in John six thirty seven. And all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. What a beautiful picture. John 6, 37 helps us to know that we are, uh, that he has the power to forgive, that he has the power to take away our troubles. He has the power to do all of the things that he promises to do as we are brought to him who brings us. The Father brings us. He draws us. He puts faith into us. We respond by either going to Christ or rejecting Christ. And my dear friends, there will be a, there will be a, there will be a, a broad latitude of people on the day of judgment. And those that were given faith, and all those who hear the word of God are given faith and responded and trusted in Christ, they'll be washed and cleansed and entered into their eternal home and glory. But those that were given the Holy Spirit and the faith and the word of God, just like this crew over here, but said, no, thank you, I'd rather follow my flesh, I'd rather follow the world, and I'd rather follow the lies of the devil, and I'd like to just dip my toe in the promises of God and pretend that I'm a Christian, but I'm really not a Christian because I've never had fruit of a true born-again follower of Jesus, so I am really kind of just a pretender. That crowd... And the Bible says, broad is the road which most people will go. Broad is the road which most people will go that are playing the game. And narrow is the gate which only a few people will go that will be in eternal glory. And Jesus has come to show us the picture through the one that returned to him with grateful heart, arms. How did he return to him? Well, he returned to him because of those mighty hands willing to help, which brings me to point two. His hands are strong, and they help. Mark chapter 1, verse 41 talks about the picture. He says, filled with compassion, he reached out his hand, and what did he do? He, he touched the man. 
His hands are strong and the Bible says that he saw them and he said, go, it's an imperative command. Go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, it said they were cleansed. They were not cleansed when he said go. They took off running and as they were running, the scales started falling from their, their, their arms and their, their, their skin started growing back and the sores started disappearing. And as they ran closer and closer, and I'm gonna think they probably weren't walking, but they were running with joy in their heart knowing that I have, I'm going to be healed. And as they ran, they were cleansed. And others, others might have walked by that group of 10 people and just ignored them as they walked by. But, but not Jesus. Jesus saw what a sorry mess they were. Jesus saw that they were in need of a touch from him and he was fully aware of their miserable condition. He also saw their faith and and. and, and and they put their faith in him when Jesus was speaking. Faith was created deeper and deeper. They were hopeless and helpless. They went to Christ. They cried out. Christ started speaking his word into them. More faith was created and they leaned into him. And he put them to the test by telling them to go to the priest. Let me ask you a question today. Is your faith being put to the test this month? Has it been a hard Hard week, hard month, hard year? Do you call upon the name of Jesus, but you're wondering where he is and why he's not there? Are you wondering why he's not been willing to help you through some of the things you're struggling with? Well, my friend, I want to share with you that there's a parallel between the dread disease of leprosy and the dread disease of sin. And the difference is between the manner of leprosy, which ostracizes its victims from all of the Christian or the Jewish community, and the manner in which sin severs us from God and from God's people. You see, when you're living in sin, you don't want to fellowship with God's people. You don't want to go to Bible study. You don't want to do devotionals. You don't want to surrender. You don't want to put your flesh under the hearing of God's word and stop looking at pornography and stop cheating with your eyes and lusting after some woman in the workplace or dreaming of some guy that would rather be a better husband than the man you're married to. Or you don't want to stop... Uh, uh, with your gossiping lips and putting the worst construction and looking for little ways that you can find things in people that are doing things wrong. No, you'd rather go and play on the edge of hell and never confess it and pretend that you're good than to come clean and say, God, have mercy on me like these lepers beating their chest, crying out to him. You see, Jesus saw them, and he had compassion on them. And that compassion produced three gospel things in that imperative command. And I want you to take note, confirmation clue students, get your pens out and start writing. Number one, the gospel imperative command produced, number one, the instructions for the lepers to go to the priest. And what was going on? Well, Jesus talks as if the miracle had already occurred. He, he, he takes the healing for granted, not in a bad way, but he's talking like, yeah, you've already been healed. But they're looking at themselves and they're saying, no, we haven't. But Jesus is speaking like, yes, you have. And, and, and what do they do? It, it, it causes them to take off bolting for the priest. It reminds me of Isaiah 65, 24 that says, before they call, I will answer. While they are speaking, I've already heard them. This is a God who knows your thoughts, who knows your hearts, and always is there with you. This is a God who calls us. He brings us into faith. Starting at the waters, he brings us into faith. At the communion table, in the body and the blood, he brings us into faith. When I'm preaching the word and declaring the love of God, he brings us into faith. And what are we doing? We're believing we're forgiven when we cry out to God. And where is the goal? Where's the priest we're running towards? Well, it's not a priest here on earth. It's a priest in heaven called Jesus and our focus is home not this earth our focus is Christ and we're running towards him amen that's where we're running towards believing that whatever we're suffering with whatever we're sick with that God is going to heal us as we keep reminding ourselves of the promise that lives in us and got us who spoke faith into us and point two the gospel flowing from this imperative command of Jesus is his directive requires faith by all ten lepers for them to have asked for healing and then to have been told to go to the priest. They take off running. 
that by the time they arrived, their miracle would have occurred. Ultimately, what God is showing them, without them even comprehending what he's doing, is he's showing them, you just walk in blind faith, and God will do the verb. God will do the thing that our flesh is always trying to do for us. Oh, if I just do this better. Oh, God will be happy with this. If I could just start praying 12 hours instead of two minutes or one 30-second prayer. If I could just get with it more and more. God says, just take off. Ultimately, God is doing the verb and the author of faith who gives such faith, which is Jesus, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says that it is by grace you've been saved through faith, not, a, not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. And then three, this is big. Jesus conforms to the law of Moses because he knew that the lepers were concerned they wanted to be welcomed back, and the only way for them to be welcomed back was through the priest. And so Jesus conforms to the laws of Moses. He tells them to go to the priest. They come back, and Jesus followed the rules of God for us, and he set them free to follow the, the laws and rules of Moses so that they could be free, and he sets you free. In fact, those that are truly free in Christ find it a joy to live in submission to the rules instead of kicking against the goads and wanting to do everything to fight against the rules. Point three, Jesus, our divine healer, his act deserves our gratitude, verses 15 through 19. On one occasion, Jesus touched the leper in Mark 1.41. We talked about that a little earlier. I want you to think of Jesus' compassion as he takes upon himself the leprosy of sin at the cross where he became sin for all of mankind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it said, God made him to be sin who was no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He bore all of our iniquities. He bore all of our sins. He bore all of our mistakes. Just like society had to stand away from the lepers and not go near the lepers, so God the Father in Matthew 27, 46 had to literally stand away from Jesus when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God put a gulf between the Father and the Son. The dreaded innocence of Jesus had to face all of all of, all of the sins that you and I have ever committed, the sins of all of mankind, were dropped onto Jesus and God had nothing to do with him so he could be the full and complete sacrifice. God had to separate so that when Jesus rose from again, rose from the dead and joined God in heaven again, that that sacrifice done outside of the Trinity would be an acceptable sacrifice because the Trinity can have nothing to do with sin. Jesus literally bore your sin and my sin and the Father, compelled by his own holiness, had to distance himself from the Son. This was all done so that Jesus could make a way to draw us by the Holy Spirit into heaven through the perfect work that he lived and worked out here on earth. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, when God touches you, how do you respond? When the Holy Ghost comes upon you and he gives you faith and he trusts you, what do you do? Well, I want us to look at one leper who responded the right way. One leper who got it. One leper who turned back to the one who spoke faith and gave him everything. And when he got back to Jesus, he fell on his knees and he cried out to Jesus. He confessed his belief in Jesus and through thanksgiving and praise he showed Jesus that he had received the grace of God which had got him, uh, set him free and give him the hope. You see, this leper not only believed that he was healed and received by Christ, but by his actions we read that he believed in the one who healed him. My dear friends, if you've been struggling, if you've been hurting, if you've been coming back to church week after week, re reading the word of God, you're running just like those lepers. You're running to the priest, the great high priest, and you're trusting that the promise is gonna completely cleanse you and set you free. And I'm telling you today, if you run with the thanksgiving of what God has done for you through his death and resurrection, this healing that he proclaims for you is a healing that is done now. It's gonna happen as you run. Keep your eyes on the cross. Keep believing 
believing in Christ, keep confession and affirmation on your lips and say, I believe in Jesus. I trust that he's going to heal me. And as God's words keep speaking to you, receive the healing now. Just, just say, God, I need this and I receive it. I want your healing. I'm hungry for a healing. Whatever your emotional try is, maybe it's a, a physical thing. I, God can heal physical things. He can deal with emotional and, and traumatic things. Whatever your hurt is, whatever the separation has been, just receive God's declaration and be healed. That's what the leper shows us to do as we respond to God. Let us stand and respond now with a grateful heart.